Hey everyone, welcome to the seventh lecture in our series on imitation learning. I'm Sanjivan Chaudhary, a research scientist at Aurora and soon to be assistant professor at Cornell. Today, we'll look at imitation learning through a Bayesian lens, where the robot leverages a prior over possible cost functions and narrows down their uncertainty based on observations from a human. We'll see why this problem, fundamentally one of exploration versus exploitation, is intractable and discuss remedies that are both intuitive and that works well in practice. Let's begin today by looking at a different but arguably far more difficult application of helping grandma in the kitchen. So in this scenario, we have grandma cooking your favorite recipe in the kitchen and needs help retrieving a jar from the top shelf, maybe the pickle jar. You have a robot arm uh, that's up to doing the task. So grandma tells the robot arm, can you bring me that jar? Now to grandma, it's obvious that she's referring to the pickle jar based on the recipe she's cooking, but the robot doesn't know this. Instead, the robot has a prior over which of the three jars she could be meaning based on the available context at that time, the recipe she is cooking, what she usually wants, and so on. As a result, the robot starts moving towards the third jar, the peanut butter jar, thinking that's what she meant. It is at this time grandma intervenes by saying, no, one on the left. Based on this feedback, the robot is able to infer a posterior over the probabilities over the jars and realize that she's actually talking about the first jar, the pickle jar. And then it updates its motions to go pick that jar and uh, grandma's very happy. Okay, so can we formalize this interaction between the robot and grandma in a Bayesian paradigm? Just as before, we'll begin by writing down an MTP, which is a collection of state, action, transition function, and costs. But this time, the cost function is not only unknown, but has a parameter theta over which we have a reasonable prior here. For example, in this setting, the parameter theta could be you know, which of the three um, jars did grandma want? Uh, the theta 1 could refer to the pickle jar, theta 2 to the jam jar in the middle, theta 3 to the peanut butter jar. The key characteristic is that theta is latent. We never observe theta directly. Instead, what we get is observations from a human partner. Uh, observations yt, which could be you know go left, or it could be emotional observations like move faster, and so on. Finally, we have an observation model, PYT, given theta, that tells us the probability of an observation given a parameter theta. For example, given that grandma wanted the peanut butter, what is the probability of her saying left? Um, and that would be very low. That's how the robot is able to inf update its belief. So, the robot starts with a prior P theta, takes an action STAT, gets an observation Y of T, and updates theta. And this update of theta can be performed using Bayes' rule. It essentially states the posterior probability P theta given Y of T is proportional to the prior probability P of theta times the observation model P of YT given theta. To solve this problem, the robot has to fundamentally trade off two quantities, exploration and exploitation. Exploration is required for the robot to collapse uncertainty about P of theta. For example, which pickle jar did grandma want? While exploitation is required for the robot to actually perform low-cost actions, to actually retrieve the jar and provide it to grandma. So how can we optimally trade off these two quantities? Let's think about the question, how hard is it to search the space of beliefs to find the optimal sequence of actions? What do we mean by belief? Define belief BT to be the probability over theta at time t. Uh, as we discussed, this belief is updated by Bayes' rule, where the new belief is the old belief times the observation model, and then normalized after that. 
Now the robot policy pi is both a function of the state and the belief and maps this to an action. The goal is to find a policy pi that incurs the minimum cumulative cost, C theta STAT, where theta is drawn from the belief B naught and updated uh, based on observations that are received. So actions are drawn from pi, observations are received from the observation model, states evolve according to dynamics, and belief evolves according to the belief dynamics uh, function. Now this might be a lot to unpack, so let's walk through our example. So we begin with three jars, and we have a prior over the three of them. So this is B0. Now the robot at this state and belief has um, three possible actions. It can either try to approach jar one, or jar two, or jar three. For simplicity, let's assume that the first action is minus one, second, zero, then the third one, one. Now the human can respond to this um, action by with an observation, yft. So observation could be sentence theater, uh, uh, for example, go left or go right or simply do nothing. The robot in turn can then consider various actions and then think about the various responses the human can offer. And this branching can continue on and on and on till finally the robot reaches a state where it's collapsed the uncertainty and picks the right jar. By now, you realize that this tree is ginormous. It has many, many, many branches, uh, which makes this a difficult problem to solve. The difficulty is concretely double exponential. It's exponential in dimensions, which scales with the number of objects, and it's exponential in time. As the time increases, the size of the tree exponentially explodes. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the hardness of these belief space planning problems, or otherwise known as PomDP problems, um, I highly recommend checking out this paper by David Su uh, about what makes some problem, PomDB problems harder than others. And if you're actually interested in solving PomDB problems, um, Despot by Saman et al. is a pretty good practical solver. Okay, so taking a step back, we learned that optimal belief space planning is pretty hard. How can one proceed? Well, there are fundamentally three options that we can entertain. The first is to use reasonable approximations. For example, QMDP being one such approximation. And this wonderful paper by Jiftani et al. shows how this is useful in practice. A second approach is to simplify the interaction model between the robot and the human. For example, uh, Bayesian active learning uh, by Golovin et al. is a perfect such example that we'll talk about shortly. Finally, the third option is to change the metric from Bayes optimality to something like Bayesian regret. And Ian Osman's fantastic paper on posterior sampling explores this in the context of reinforcement learning. In the interest of time, we will skip talking about the first uh, avenue and directly jump to the second setting of Bayesian active learning. Interestingly, Bayesian active learning is one such field that has been studied quite extensively and has important application in the fields of medical diagnosis. What makes Bayesian active learning somewhat tractable is it does two important simplifications. First, there's no MTP, there's no notion of state. And second, it's only concerned with exploration, in other words, reducing uncertainty. To understand this better, let's slightly modify our problem. Let's say the goal of the robot was to simply identify which jar the human wanted. In the Bayesian active learning setting, we would define a hypothesis space, theta1 to theta n, where each hypothesis represents a possible jar that the human might have wanted. We then need to define a set of tests. Here, tests are questions that the robot asks the human. A good analogy is the game of 20 questions, where player one thinks of a place or an animal, and player two tries to ask uh, various questions up to 20 to figure out what they're thinking of. 
is exactly the setting we're in. When the robot asks the human a question, the human responds with an answer, uh, which is a set of possible outcomes. Upon receiving this outcome, the robot can then update its hypothesis by eliminating hypotheses that are inconsistent with the test outcome pairs. And so the goal is to find a policy pi that in minimal number of steps collapses uncertainty such that the belief p theta is equal to zero for all theta other than theta star. In other words, it's identified the true hypothesis. At this point, you might be thinking, how is this easier? It seems like we would still have to search over a very large belief space. And this is where Dolovan and Cross had a beautiful result. In a nutshell, they showed that if the objective function that we are searching over satisfies a very important property known as adaptive submodularity, then simply by being greedy, by greedily picking tests, one can be near optimal. We'll now talk about a simple but powerful algorithm that uses this property. The algorithm is called Generalized Binary Search. We begin with the initial prior over theta, P of theta. The algorithm then proceeds to iteratively select tests and receive observations until P of theta fully collapses. In other words, it collapses such that there's only one theta that has a non-zero probability. In each iteration, we are going to greedily pick a test that shrinks uncertainty by the maximum amount. In math, this means greedily picking a test that maximizes the following objective. Objective is the current belief over theta minus the posterior uh, belief over theta given expected observations that you might receive. Think of the first term as being the number of consistent hypotheses and the second term as being the number of consistent hypotheses after executing the test. Finally, we execute test T star, receive an observation Y of T, update the posterior over theta, and repeat this process. We show a quick illustration of how the algorithm works because it's visually very intuitive. So imagine you have uh, a set of eight hypotheses shown by the eight dots uh, you're, you're uncertain about which of these dots is the true hypothesis. You can do two tests, T1 and T2. T1 has two different observations. Um, you know, one of the observations leads to three of the hypotheses being slashed. Um, so you're left with five. The other observation leads to sort of four of the hypotheses being slashed. So you're left with four. So on average, the number of consistent hypotheses after T1 would be 4.5. Similarly, T2... Uh, leads to an average of 6.5. So clearly we would pick T1 because that leads to the biggest reduction in uncertainty from 8 to 4.5. This process is repeated till the number of consistent hypotheses only one, that is, identified which is the true hypothesis. And the claim is that this is done in a near optimal number of steps by generalized binary search, which is a pretty cool result given how simple the algorithm is. So in the example we just looked at, uh, we had a discrete number of hypotheses. The question is, would this idea extend to a regime where we have a continuous set of hypotheses? For example, uh, we are uncertain about a continuous set of cost functions. The answer is yes. So there's a paper by Darcy Sadiq et al. that looks at the problem of recovering the human's um, latent cost functions by asking them if they prefer trajectory A or trajectory B. First of all, let's assume that we are in the linear cost setting. So here, the cost of a trajectory is equal to W transpose times the features of that trajectory. So let's look at a concrete example. We have the same robot arm trying to help grandma, but this time the robot's confused about how to optimally grasp a jar of pickles. One set of costs would prefer that it grasp it from the left. Another set of costs would prefer it grasp it from the right. The robot asks the human, do you prefer A over B? And the answer may be something like, yes. Based on this response, the robot can eliminate a lot of potential cost functions from being consistent.
So what does the continuous hypothesis space look like? Um, well, think of it as all possible W vectors um, that uh, can explain data. So in the beginning, um, you can think of uh, a unit sphere where W vectors are uniformly spread uh, in that unit sphere. So the test, as we just discussed, is a question that compares any two trajectories, xi A and xi B. And the outcome is binary. Either it's yes, it's cheaper, or no, it's not. So we're going to apply a, a very similar algorithm to generalized binary search in this setting. Again, the algorithm, like before, initializes with a prior over Ws. For example, W is in a unit ball. It now has to search over the set of potential questions that it can ask uh, the human. Think of a question as a pair of trajectories, xi and xi b, that it will ask the human um, to compare. To visualize this, we are not going to look at the trajectories, but instead look at the features of xi and xi b trajectories, since that's what it matters. So, you know, let a two dimensional feature space be f1 and f2. You can think of the true trajectories xi and xi b being points in the feature space, depending on the values they contain. Based on the human's answer, we can say, you know, maybe xi is cheaper than xi b. And this results in a possible set of potential w's that may explain this, this preference. So you can intuit that the goal is to pick an informative test, a pair of xi and xi b, such that based on the answers, a lot of w vectors can be eliminated. So mathematically, we can write this as select a test that maximizes the difference between P of W, this is the original probability over W, minus the posterior over W given um, the test you picked and the expected response you saw. A good way to think about P of W is to think about the volume of space uh, that potential Ws occupy. Right. So the first term represents the initial volume of all consistent W vectors, while the second term represents the volume of W conditioned on tests at the expected observation. So the objective represents how much volume of W is slashed. Okay, so once you have this test, you query it, you get an outcome Y, and then you go ahead and you update uh, your belief over W. And you do this until you've narrowed it down to a single W that explains your data. So taking a step back, we saw that active learning by simplifying the interaction model allows us to come up with efficient algorithms that are near Bayes optimal. Let's now talk about a third option where we change the very metric we are chasing and show that that can be optimized efficiently. Okay, so the basic premise is that Bayes' optimality seems very hard. And in the past, our go-to strategy has been to turn hard problems into a game. And that's what we're going to apply today as well. So recall the setting. Your cost function C of theta is unknown. So just as in previous lectures, we are going to set up a game between a learner and an adversary. The learner plays policy pi 1, while an adversary selects a loss over the policy L of theta pi 1. The interesting thing about the setting is that the loss explicitly depends on theta. In other words, the loss is the cumulative cost incurred by the policy uh, under the cost function C of theta. So just as in lecture 3, we can go ahead and define the notion of regret which is the cumulative loss incurred by the policies being played by the learner minus the, the cumulative loss of the best policy in hindsight. So in other words, regret captures how well would a uh, learner do if it had all the data in advance. Crucial difference here is that the regret explicitly depends on the para unknown parameter theta. Now, crucially, unlike in lecture three, where, where we were considering losses to vary in an adversarial manner, here we have a prior uh, P of theta. So it makes sense to look at the notion of expected regret or Bayesian regret, where we look at the regret under expectation 
of this prior distribution p of theta. Notice how the familiar trade up between exploration and exploitation arises here. So we need to explore to collapse p of theta, and we need to exploit to keep losses low. And sort of minimizing expected regret implicitly gives us this trade off. So the question remains what sort of algorithms reduce expected regret? So we'll talk about an old but extremely simple and effective algorithm called Thomson sampling that has in the last decade enjoyed a resurrection of sorts, thanks to some wonderful work done by Daniel Russo, uh, Ian Osborne, and Benjamin Van Roy. I highly recommend checking out this tutorial to, to know more. Okay, so the way the algorithm goes is you begin as usual by initializing with the prior distribution P of theta. So let's look at the cost function learning example where a robot arm is trying to figure out the optimal cost function to go grab a jar of pickles. So it's uncertain about um, these, these various cost functions. And the algorithm proceeds iteratively where at each iteration we sample a theta from our current P of theta. We sample a cost function. We then compute an optimal policy that minimizes this cost function. Um, and this optimum policy is then executed. At this point, um, we would receive an observation from the human that might say more to the left. Right? So, so based on this observation, uh, we can, one can update uh, the posterior over uh, theta using Bayes' rule and keep repeating this process. So, Okay, so in round two, the robot's only left with cost functions that prefer going more to the left. It then pricks an extreme uh, theta that, that really goes to the left and receives an observation that says to the right. And in round three, the robot's really left with a set of thetas that are pretty much on top of each other. So when it does play a policy by three, it gets an observation from grandma that says, good enough, job done. Now this simple algorithm enjoys a theoretical bound on the Bayesian regret that reads as um, order of t, number of time steps, s, number of states, square root of a, number of actions, and n, the number of iterations. And that last term, n, is important because it, that essentially says that the average regret goes to zero. In other words, stereo sampling is a no-regret algorithm. So for more, for more details on the derivations of these proofs, I recommend reading this uh, paper by Osmond et al. on um, how posterior sampling helps solve exploration and exploitation trade-offs in reinforcement learning. And with that, uh, we are at an end. So to recap, the key question that we asked in this lecture is how can we leverage a prior on possible cost functions? We saw that this problem is Fundamentally, one of exploration versus exploitation. Exploration to reduce uncertainty about the cost functions and exploitation to act optimally. We saw that Bayes' optimality is intractable because searching the space of beliefs requires uh, a double exponential runtime. Finally, we saw that uh, a way to make progress is to look at the simpler setting, that of active learning, where greedy algorithms are near optimal. Or one can change the metric and look at Bayesian regret, and a simple posterior sampling enjoys uh, no regret property. So on a parting note, we leave you once again with the recurring observation of this series that whenever we have a hard problem, in this case Bayes optimality, we should check if we can turn it into an easier problem, for example, solving a game. And it is on this very insight that we will lay the foundations of a unified framework for solving imitation learning in uh, upcoming lectures. But until then, be well, everyone.